Hello and welcome to American Backslider. My name is Dwayne Walker and I'm coming to you from the backslider capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. And this is where you have fine upstanding pillars of the community coming down to Las Vegas to venture outside the city limits to visit some of Nevada's legal brothels. This is also where you have people who claim to be fiscal conservatives coming down to Las Vegas to, well, spend their money on the most ridiculous and overpriced items in the world. Las Vegas used to be where you came to have bargains, to have dollar 39 steak dinners, but those days are gone. However, with all the changes Las Vegas has been through over the years, one thing that isn't changing, this is where people come for quick solutions, for quick money, and for experiences. Some people play it safe, other people are rather reckless. And I will be presenting to you the American Backsliders Guide to Las Vegas in uh, the upcoming episodes, in which I will take you on tours of things that you probably wouldn't even be thinking about going to if you were coming to Las Vegas. And the first place I'm going to take you is to a museum that shows us what really motivates Las Vegas and ultimately what motivates the world. The Harry Money Erotic Heritage Museum contains everything from archaeological finds to ancient manuscripts and writings by people like the Marquis de Sade, uh, displays about certain notorious personalities like uh, Elizabeth Bathory, who was known for uh, bathing in blood because she thought it would keep her skin pure. Their painting, it does bring things up to speed to our current time as well, with various displays celebrating the many different lifestyles from uh, polyamory to LBGTQ. There is an exhibit on adult theaters and adult movies from the 60s and 70s, and I was struck at this display of an adult movie theater, um, and you'll notice that there's a poster featuring Hayapesha Lee, who, in addition to being a legend in the adult entertainment industry, was my first celebrity interview. And believe it or not, when I had her on my show back in the early 90s, we didn't even talk about the adult video industry. My father is the one who is of a strict Baptist background, Southern Baptist upbringing, you know, the no shorts for the girls, no cards, no red dresses, oh, and dancing is sinful. Yeah, a whole nine yards, yeah. So um, they noticed that I was depressed and going to church, you know, six or seven days a week. Of course, the minister was brought in to, you know, what is the depression here? And, you know, I felt like I had some camaraderie built up there after a little bit of time with this particular preacher. And he, you know, I, I confided in with him what had happened to me with my stepfather, um, the sexual abuse and things like that. And he said, well, let's pray for your forgiveness for your sins. For your forgiveness. Right. Wait a minute. I'm 12 years old here. You know, you're telling me my forgiveness for my sins? I think we're talking about this man here that did something. And it was like, well, honor thy mother and thy father, and thou shalt not question authority. And all of this does bear mentioning because... There is a display at the museum dedicated to those who have been sexually abused and are trying to come to terms with positive views regarding their sexual identity without all the false shame that religious and uh, societal dogmas may inflict upon us. There's also another display dedicated to women who have sexually abused minors as well, and most of those have been teachers. When you enter the museum, one of the first displays you see is one called Sinners, which shows the scandals that a number of politicians and religious figures and others have fallen into. So I got a chance to speak with the director of the Erotic Museum, Victoria Hartman, and asked her about that. Well, that was actually uh, Mr. Moni's brainchild. Um, he's been dealing with the law and the Supreme Court and Congress and so forth his entire career and uh, one of the things I think that he's trying to communicate with that exhibit is how our leaders religious political or otherwise want us to live our lives a certain way um, especially when it comes to sex they'll legislate sex they will penalize sex they will uh, outlaw sex toys, sex films, what have you, 
And yet, if you look into their lives, they're doing the same thing. They're watching pornography, they're having affairs. So, Miss, I think Mr. Mone's intentions with that exhibit was to point out the hypocrisy of our leaders and how they legislate our bodies and yet don't uh, adhere to the same legislation and the same rules and the same divine laws as they tell us to live by. And so I think that was his point behind that exhibit. So it's still here. <laughs> I asked her how she would describe this museum to those who weren't familiar with it. Well, the Erotic Heritage Museum's history was built on a relationship between Mr. Money, my boss, and uh, Dr. Ted Mechelvena, who was a Methodist minister in San Francisco, who was a, a big advocate for LGBT rights, especially gay rights, in San Francisco in the 60s. And they befriended one another and stayed friends and decided that together they wanted to preserve as much erotic heritage as they could together, um, because a lot of it's destroyed by mainstream museums and so forth. So. They built this museum and um, that mission has continued. That's our job too, is uh, to preserve erotic history. And that includes anything from artifacts, which are, I think the oldest ones we have date back to 1500 BCE. And uh, also artwork, not so much modern artwork. We do have some modern art galleries here, but most of it is uh, really old art. Um, we have some pieces that are four or 500 years old here. Um, and the whole focus is on the, the science and art of erotica. You might be interested to know that this is not the only erotic museum around. There are several all over the world. Actually, the Erotic Heritage Museum is part of a consortium of erotic museums around the world. Um, we are um, in affiliation with the uh, Sex Museum in Amsterdam. Um, we're in affiliation with the Sex Museum in Barcelona. Uh, we did have an affiliation with the Paris Erotic Museum. Unfortunately, that closed a couple of years ago and everything was auctioned off. It was one of the, I would argue that that was the best of all of us, that the Paris Museum was just lovely and was the oldest one. Um, but as for how many erotic museums, well, there's the Phallological Museum in Iceland that the museum is looking to have a relationship with. Um, there are several in Asia. I'm not so sure about places like Russia or the Middle East. Um, and then uh, we have ours here. There was one in Hollywood that unfortunately closed. Uh, there's one in New York. Um, but most of it are like small galleries and collections. Um, and I think there's also an erotic museum in Thailand, but that's more like a sculpture park. And it's a sculpture park of a bunch of penis uh, sculptures. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but I don't know you would call that a museum. <laughs> People do seem to think of Las Vegas as a socially liberal, freewheeling place, but you'll be surprised. The Erotic Heritage Museum has actually received pushback from the city of Las Vegas. Yep, uh, actually, um, what was it, about a year ago, uh, well, actually two things happened. Um, one was a little bit before my time. When we first opened, we had some murals out on the south uh, side of the building. And those were murals of um, topless cartoon characters. And the city descended on the museum and said, no, 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 um, that's obscenity. You have to cover that up. And so we put pasties on the nipples of the cartoon characters. Um, eventually, those pasties fell off, and the cartoon characters were exposed again. But they never came back around to, to cite us or anything. Um, and those were, ended up being covered up by the puppetry, uh, our advertisements that we have now, the puppetry, the penis show that we have here. Um, and the second time was, uh, there was an organization out of Denver who was hosting the world's largest orgy about a year ago. And uh, it was featured on uh, Stephen Colbert on The Tonight Show. And it exposed their relationship with the embassy suites and the parent company of the embassy suites ended up canceling the entire booking so um they we approached them and said hey we'd like to sponsor you or work with you in some fashion and they were like can we have the orgy there and uh once we announced that um, and we were going to close the museum to the public it was only going to be for the attendees and they were basically renting the, the building out uh, i was visited by vice by uh, Las Vegas PD. Um, I got calls from our attorneys that the city government had called our attorneys. Um, and then I got another visit from Vice and then we had to bring on our uh, one of our ACLU attorneys, the same gentleman that defended the Green Door uh, here in town. And um, 
at the last minute, the uh, folks who were organizing it got a cease and desist and they moved it to the green door like an hour before the event. The point of the museum is to preserve these precious artifacts and, and art pieces and the science of it um, because there's willful intention to destroy this stuff by politicians, conservatives, um, you know, our, um, religious conservatives and so forth. And studying sexuality and studying the art and history of sexuality gives you perspective into different cultures, different time periods, and how people think and feel about sexuality. And that's not something you can get necessarily from an academic study, right? So just like it's important to preserve other cultural artifacts, it's important to preserve those that relate to sex as well because we can learn so much about ourselves and our humanity through that. Thank you for watching American Backslider. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Stay aware, stay woke, support democracy. See you next time.